on a normal job like that, you, you might need a gallon of cleaning product for every uh, two, two to 500 square feet of area that you are working in. Sometimes uh, in the sake of trying to make things less labor intensive, we've used excessively powerful cleaning products that just far exceed what's necessary to accomplish the job. And in doing so, uh, there's an increased reliance on excessive chemical usage versus the tried and true uh, standard, um, standardized or, or required means of remediation, which is through cleaning and removal. Hydrogen peroxide in high concentrations is actually more dangerous to aquatic organisms than, than uh, dilute concentrations of, of hypochlorite are. So everything is based on concentration. Uh, we, we rarely recognize that. You can have a very dangerous chemical um, or uh, component, but in small quantities, it's, it's a, it does a great job and it has, it's just a benign to the environment. It has very little impact on the environment. Question that I have there, like, how do you actually determine how much chemical you need? I mean, but what's the process of um, calculation or, or what are the important variables that you need to look at determining kind of this remediation work? Yeah, so there's all different there's all different types of remediation projects and different remediation projects will require different quantities of cleaner or different techniques that are used. Different types of cleaning pro products based on the typical uh, or the, the job that you're working on. So an average remediation project includes containment where you're isolating the area uh, from the rest of the home. A lot of times that involves different types of pressurization. Uh, most often it's negative pressurization where you're drawing air from that space and injecting it into the outdoors or through a filter system into an unaffected area. You're removing moldy materials and then you're using processes to eliminate the dust and the mold spores that have been released into that environment. So that's done with vacuuming. We use HEPA filtration technology or even um, more fine particulate now, ultra fine particulate vacuuming to remove those dust particulates from an area. And then we're cleaning most often with wet cleaning methods. Um, so uh, this is where the dot cleaning product would come into play where you're wiping down or spraying chemical cleaners onto surfaces and then wiping them down. And then uh, many times there's a secondary vacuuming that's done where you're vacuuming again for any displaced or dislodged particulate that was that happened during the wet cleaning process. Some folks will then do other steps. Uh, that's not uni uniformly done, but uh, there's uh, fogging techniques that are used to sterilize or decontaminate an area. Um, and then there's also surface treatments applied to different surfaces for preventing mold from growing, whether it's a pigmented sealer like a paint um, that's applied to a surface or non-pigmented sealers or preventative agents like uh, there's a, a, a silver nitrate uh, preventative that's out there and there's a bunch, bunch of different ones. So th that's a typical job on, on, a, on a normal job like that. You, you might need a gallon of cleaning product for every uh, two, two to 500 square feet of area that you are working in, uh, very, very common. When you are using a more um, chemically intense cleaning method, so there's certain scenarios uh, here in central Indiana, we do a lot of crawl space cleaning and we actually use a, a soft wash type of methodology where we're using more chemical to, to wash surfaces clean, um, like maybe you've seen people do on the outside of homes. And you could certainly do um, uh, there's staining that uh, is often present on wood decking and attics in a, a big chunk of the country. And um, uh, you can remove that staining with heavier chemical usage. And in those scenarios, you're going to be using uh, a gallon of product for every 100 to 200 square feet of floor or surface area. That's, that's really common. I've, I tend to use surface area or uh, a, a floor area as opposed to actual surface area that you're cleaning because the average um, technician, the guys I've trained, you know, 100 guys over the years, and um, the average guy is not going to calculate, uh, you know, the square footage of the surfaces that they're cleaning. So it's, it's just easier to do generalities based on square footages of area.
Yeah, that's a little bit uh, um, obviously something that we are really interested in. As with Magic Plan, uh, you, you you basically walk in um, with your phone, do a quick scan uh, of the property, and then you have all the measurements um, at hand: surface, yeah. floor, including windows, doors, excluding, and so on and so forth. And like my assumption was somehow, and I think like you partly answered that that. Also, some of that excessive chemical use was just kind of like to be sure it's enough. Mm. Um, and, and maybe uh, if, if at hand you had something to do a quick back of the envelope calculation and say, okay, that's actually the finite amount I need, um, then that uh, is something that's helpful. But now with the dot cleaning product, um, I like is, is, is the absolute quantities the same or is it uh, less? How does it compare um, uh, through to the traditional methods? Yeah, it's a great question. So many times there's a, a misunderstanding. When I say we're using less chemical, we're not using less volume so much as we're using less concentration. So the problem is not necessarily that people are over using volumes of chemical. Um, spraying too much product or, or applying too much product. It's that the concentration of the products that they're using are, are very high. So for example, um, in the remediation industry, it's very common and popular right now to use 20 or higher uh, percent hydrogen peroxide that's sprayed on a surface. And you know, it sounds safe, right? Like it's hydrogen peroxide. I put that on a cut last week. Well, that's 3%. You know, the stuff that you put on your skin is 3% and that can burn you. It'll take a while, but it's, I mean, it's pretty mild. You bump that up to 20% and all of a sudden you've got something that's actually very dangerous. 30% um, is as high as you can ship without calling it an explosive. So, <laughs> you know, they do power rockets with this stuff when it gets high enough. I mean, um, I had a, a gentleman a couple of weeks ago tell me he was cleaning a bathroom with 30% hydrogen peroxide. And I... I might be one of the few people I know that have actually tried this. I've tried just about everything you can imagine. Um, and it's it's just really dangerous. So it it works pretty well. Um, but in the in, in our dot um, team, we often say that's like dropping a, a you know a nuclear bomb on a situation that really just required a little bit of you know elbow grease. So um, sometimes uh, in the sake of trying to make things less labor intensive, we've used excessively powerful cleaning products that just far exceed what's necessary to accomplish the job. And in doing so, uh, there's an increased reliance on excessive chemical usage versus the tried and true uh, standard, um, standardized or, or required means of remediation, which is through cleaning and removal. So, so we never want to be in a place where we're the, the cleaning chemical is somehow um, taking the place of actual remediation efforts. There's ways you can utilize chemical. There's lots of ways that you can use it. Um, and there's certainly more chemically um, uh, intense ways of cleaning surfaces uh, as opposed to, to doing things dry. Um, but you, you, ne you never want to get into the, the, the concept that the cleaner itself is doing the work. So maybe it can, like there's certain situations where it can, but those are generally fairly minor, you know, light, light problems. Cool. So in those, what was the hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide uh, and those 30%, I mean, we, Jackson and I were in a meeting yesterday where we talked about OSHA regulations. I mean, doesn't, doesn't all this chemicals uh, require you to be kind of compliant to completely different standards and, and, and like, doesn't, couldn't your life be so much easier? Yeah, um, so the standard um, holds us to a fairly high level of safety. So part of the ICRC S520 standard um, references the um, uh, OSHA standards. So we have, uh, you know, occupational health and safety standards that need to be followed. Uh, most remediation contractors should have some form of uh, respiratory program. They should have some health and safety program. Um, my guess is that a lot of users of uh, Magic Plan are going to be smaller. So our industry is full of um, small operators that have, you know, one to one to five trucks. And um, it can be very challenging, um, you know, to put a, a respirator, <laughs> respiration plan together. Um, having technology at our hands like Magic Plan that allows us to have some of the benefits of a larger corporation uh, handy. 
uh, and, and uh, technology literally in the palm of our hand makes a lot of that easier. Um, but yeah, there's standards in, in most of the cleaning products that we use in the remediation industry create environments that would exceed the threshold limit values of, you know, occupancy without a respirator on. So uh, that's almost universally true. Hydrogen peroxide is tricky. So, um, you know, you can have a lot of hydrogen peroxide in the air and it's it's hydrogen and, and oxygen and that breaks down into water and, and hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And so people just assume that those things are benign. The, the problem is, is that when they're at super high concentrations, they are very dangerous. Um, what, one little uh, factoid that most people don't know is that hydrogen peroxide has a higher acute toxicity level in in uh, uh, runoff water than chlorine does. So you actually, you, you actually, hydrogen peroxide in high concentrations is actually more dangerous to aquatic organisms than than uh, dilute concentrations of of hypochlorite are. So everything is based on concentration. Uh, we we rarely recognize that you can have a very dangerous chemical um, or uh, component and it's relatively benign at, at ultra low levels. A great example of that is um, that we use chlorine gas to treat most of our water um, in, in throughout the world. And I, you certainly wouldn't want to inhale or be around a bunch of chlorine gas. Uh, it's certainly something that we run into in the mold remediation industry. Um, but in small quantities, it's, it's a, it does a great job and it has, it's just a benign to the environment. It has very little impact on the environment. So concentration matters. And one of our primary objectives is to reduce the amount of concentration that people are using more so than, than trying to reduce the types of chemicals that they're using. It's the concentrations that they're using. There are certain chemicals that are growing in um, concern. Um, uh, quaternary ammonium chlorides are probably the most common um, uh, disinfectant in the world. They're in everything. You probably have a product under your kitchen sink right now that's got a quaternary ammonium chloride in it. Uh, hospitals use quaternary ammonium chlorides. And remediators for years have used quats because they're cheap. You can dilute them um, and they're easy to apply and they've got a broad killing spectrum to them. Uh, interestingly, a couple years ago, um, uh, one of the main uh, industry suppliers of chemicals in the industry just put a new warning label on their product that quaternary ammonium chloride compounds break down CPVC plumbing lines. <laughs> so where for years we've been worried about corrosion of metal and, you know, we don't want to mess up the brass fixtures and, you know, you've got the wiring that you've got to worry about. Yeah, come to find out we've been spraying these quats as an industry and we're actually destroying this uh, CPVC plumbing lines that just dries them out, causes them to become brittle and crack. That just came out a couple of years ago, um, and I've talked to people all over the country that just are using these um, liberally um, in in crawl spaces and you know in opened up wall cavities. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I hate to think of the number of plumbing lines that break a year from now. Maybe it's good, you know, you know, repeat customer work. <laughs> you call you for the water. Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say, I mean, that's a vicious cycle. You have like a break <laughs> leakage and then you have mold yeah. and then you come back in and then uh, yeah. that's, a, yeah. that's a literally loop, just huh? something that's become common knowledge in the last couple of years. So I think uh, I, I, I have yet I've met one person um, in my travels and my talks across the country in the last couple of years that actually was aware of it. Um, and it's known science. It's out there. Um, but we tend to be, uh, you know, behind the curve sometimes. We're busy, right? We're, we're busy cleaning up people's homes. So.